The other one um, was, well, maybe under conditions uh, of what Marxists would call monopoly capitalism, um, capitalists won't lower their prices. They stick on to a higher, uh, to a given price level uh, in the face of lower wages. Well, what happens then? Then you get something that each individual capitalist sure, capitalist sure likes. Same price for the stuff that you sell. Lower wages also means lower real wages. And that means for the individual capitalist um, that um, the individual profits might go up because labor cost is going down. That's the crucial thing, lowering labor costs. You hear it all the time. However, this is where uh, Keynes uh, jumped in and said, well, but with lower real wages, you also lower the purchasing power of all the people who make a living by spending, uh, well, by working and then spending their wages. So what you win in terms, you capitalist, you win in terms of lowering labor costs, you might actually lose in terms of selling to customers, and then you have a crisis of underconsumption. Being part of the bourgeoisie means he wanted to preserve capitalism, and he was very open about it. So what he suggested is, don't touch wages in the face of a crisis in the first place. This is why unions like Keynes uh, so much. So take uh, wages out of the solving the capitalist crisis equation and do something else. And this something else uh, was the famous uh, policy of uh, spending government money. And if you don't have it, you take uh, uh, a credit from people who have it. Even in a ca capitalist crisis, there are people who have money. There are even people who make more money during a crisis. Maybe they give you a credit. Uh, and the other thing uh, that you can do is, I talked about people having difficulty paying back their credits. Well, maybe you can ease that uh, by making credit cheaper. These two policy tools are very famous for Keynesianism, uh, and they certainly contributed um, significantly to the long boom after the Second World War. Uh, however, they later created uh, their own problems uh, in the 70s. We can discuss uh, maybe whether today there is as some people on the left suggest, uh, a time where we should reinvent Keynes, which they would argue was abandoned by neoliberalism, or whether, as Marxists uh, would say, well, Keynesianism worked for a while. Uh, it, maybe it never was fully abandoned in the first place, and in the second place, uh, if we kind of fully embark on Keynesian policies, uh, they might not work uh, in quite the same way uh, they did in the past, um, and for that reason we have, uh, um, we should uh, reinvent Marxist informed policies, uh, and uh, hopefully then uh, we might be more successful than uh, Marxists were in the 30s. And hear them come around again, hear the trumpets sound again, hear the drums resound again beneath the walls of Troy. of natural law and population trends. They set the wise to rationalize and they talk of a means and ends. They say that man was made to hunt. It's all part of the game. Economic liberalism on one hand and Marxist communism on the other hand. Ingo Schmidt presented social democracy or Keynesianism in the middle way. In other words, private-public partnerships. Now, you can add your choice of political system on neopolin.ca so, so it can be counted. But before we do that, let's listen to Alison Ayers. <laughs> 